Welcome to the Wisconsin Podcast. I'm Craig Sauer. On this podcast, we talk Wisconsin things, everything from media, sports, culture, nature, politics, and more. Today, we talk sports journalism with Adam Mertz, who's an on-air contributor for ESPN Wisconsin's pregame radio show before Badger home football games. Mertz is also formerly the sports editor for the Madison newspaper, The Capital Times. I talked with Mertz about his career in episode one, and that's worth going back to check out. On this show, we pick up on many of the topics we chatted about in our first conversation, including Badger football. But I also asked Mertz about the changing landscape for sports journalism, and briefly we talked a little bit about baseball. Uh, the last time I talked to you was kind of near the beginning of the season. We were questioning whether the Badgers could go 12-0. Uh, they did, but they lost the Big Ten cha- championship game, disappointing millions of, of Wisconsinites. <laughs> uh, but so I just kind of looking back now on the season, kind of what's your analysis of, of the year? How, how are you going to remember this year? Yeah, it's, you know, in the, in the wake of the, big defeat. I wouldn't say it was a stunning defeat by any means. You know, everyone going in knew that that was a 50-50 game at best. But you you step back and I was telling people when um, even at 10-0, at 11-0, like appreciate it, mm-hmm. you can say a lot of things about schedule and strength of schedule and whatnot. But the reality is they beat everyone who's in front of them. And that doesn't happen, you know, ever, <laughs> obviously, based on history. And so you you have to appreciate where the program is at in a general sense. I think that the it's it's really hard to to look back and not feel like the bloom is off a little bit based on that defeat. But I feel like people are really taking this thing a little harder than I thought that they would. It it all of a sudden I don't know if people expected the athleticism to match up against Ohio State, and they were shocked that it didn't. I mean, I I didn't think that going in. Um, I think that's more the disappointment of, like, is that the ceiling for Badger football? That was the question that I got from a couple of people that were, you know, texting. Is this all we have to hope for? Yeah, I mean, I I think that's – I think Badger fans have probably been waiting for that big win. I think that's the question that we're all wondering. Is there going to ever be a breakthrough? Um, and and what do you have to do to to get that breakthrough? The the thing that I think about, um, and this is while consoling my 14-year-old sobbing daughter, too, <laughs> who, has, who hasn't been through this experience before, you know, with a real chance. I mean, she doesn't remember the Russell Wilson year. To, I mean, frankly, I feel like that year was more crushing uh, because they really were – two plays away from playing in a a national title game. Um, So that's, that one's a little more hard to take. Frankly, I had people tell me today, like the loss to Penn state last year in the big 10 title game was tougher to take too, because there you had the game in hand and you, and you didn't put it away. This is Chris third year in the program. And if you look around at college football, the reality is that even in the big programs, it takes a little time to get the legs underneath it. You know, Saban coming into Alabama, that thing was not in great shakes when he got there. Once it got rolling, it was great. Not saying that that's going to happen here, but it just takes a little bit of time. He's still dealing with a little bit of fallout from what happened over the last really like, you know, three years before he got here, the last Bielema year, and then a couple of years of, of Gary Anderson. But this was one of those cycle years that came through and you're like, the talent lines up. So, you know, let's see what they can do, and let's give it a run at it. How do you grade uh, Hornybrook's uh, second season uh, with the Badgers? Did he do enough to be the presumptive starter going into camp next year, or are we still kind of waiting on what happens in the bowl game, or uh, what's his grade at this point? Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, my initial reaction is probably like a lot of people that, you know, he had a chance to win the game. Put it this way. I'll look at it the positive spin. He had a chance to win the game, and he didn't. Whether you want to go as far as saying he lost the game for the Badgers, I think, you know, that's that's putting 
too much on the quarterback position and probably too much on him given what you've seen for expectations. But the walk away from the year with him is that he, I think, has been more frustrating than any Badger quarterback. Even Stavi? Even Stavi. Even Stavi. But it's the same thing. All he does is win. I mean, for the most part. Yeah. So, I mean, it's hard to, like, criticize Hornybrook if he's winning, if he leads a team to 12-1. and one. You know what I mean? Like, it's hard to bench somebody who goes 12-1. and one. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, from, from that respect. I mean, you know, like, I guess he would get, you know, if you're looking for a grade, I'd give him a, you know, I'd give him a C. He kind of, like, did what he was asked to do for the most part. Sometimes did better. Sometimes did worse. So no giant leap? From- no giant leap. No. And, you know, it's... You see that BYU game early in the season, you're like, and you're thinking about what happened at Michigan State last year when he's yeah. coming in throwing darts and just kind of in command of what's going on in the field. And you're thinking, wow, this guy's, you know, not expecting that every game, but he's really, it's starting to click. It's starting to come forward. And then you go to moments like Saturday where you can't flip a screen pass five yards, you know, under considerable pressure, but it's still not happening. And and I think that's where the frustration level comes out is you see this these flashes, um, whereas you know like you brought up Stave, I mean I feel like, you know he was that guy that could put it together at the end of a game, and he had arm strength and he did some things well, but I didn't feel like he ever had this above board ceiling. I felt like he could have been more consistent and gotten developed more through the years. Hornibrook's got two years left. You know, with Paul Christ, who has obviously shown that he can develop quarterbacks. Frankly, like, what else do they have at that position right now? Got Jack Cohen, who I know a lot of people were high on, but you haven't seen anything. So I think I think it's I think you got to open the competition and push him in the springtime. It worked out this year for him to put him in, install him as a starter, and give him confidence and let him grow out of it. But yeah, I mean, he's got to get pushed. And I I mean, that's just competition to me. That's just like. You get better through competition, um, so don't don't just hand it to him. But I really don't see where that changes unless you get really surprised by Jack Cohen in the spring. The other thing that we were talking about a couple months ago when we when we sat down the first time uh, was was Jim Leonard, yeah, and what he was able to do. How long before somebody gives him an <laughs> offer that he can't refuse? Yeah, I mean, I know. if you're looking at what he did this year, um, his profile re- jumped up nationally. Um, how long before, you know, a small program takes a shot at like giving him even just a head coaching job? I mean, just, uh, is he at that point where he could like be fielding offers this off season? Even, yeah, I mean, or even taking a, a pro job and coaching secondary. So that's, so I always figured that that was his path. Um, with speaking completely un- uneducated on this, but it just makes sense in terms of him being, having that experience in the league really understanding defense at an NFL level. I mean, I'd want to test myself that way because like head coaching is just this whole different animal and you're, you're sort of the CEO and I know that Paul Chris calls plays. And so he still has his fingers in it for sure. And a lot of college coaches do even pro coaches, but there's so much more responsibility and and distraction from actual football. Um, I always figured that he'd be one of those guys that would, you know, become a defensive coordinator in the NFL. More than anything. How long before he gets a call from Green Bay? There's the, well, there's the question. Yeah. <laughs> right? I know that's uh, what you hear on Twitter all the time. So. Yeah. But but looking back, um, pretty impressed with, with what he's done this year? Yeah. And uh, he had the tools. He had the pieces this year. Um, I was really worried, like we talked in the last podcast, about losing Sitchi, losing Jack Sitchi at linebacker. Uh, he's a real difference maker. And I feel like still when you look at Saturday's game, not having a top end talent like Jack, not having a top end talent like Quintus Cephas really shows up in games like that where you're matched against high level athletes. And th- those are significant losses at Wisconsin and you have no margin for error at a program like that where you, you need those guys to be on the field. Um, but getting back to like the defense and what was out there again, um, you know, the secondary steps up and you look at the, their technique and the way that they play on the field, uh, you look at the way he was able to use all these different pieces and fit them in, and and you look at a game like Saturday's where they get exposed in some ways, and it actually, to me, that's even more of a compliment 
to what he's able to do schematically to cover up deficiencies because no one else even got close to sniffing any of those weaknesses this year. So it takes a team that's, you know, arguably in the top four nationally to expose that. I mean, that's a, that's a real testament to the work he did. But I, I mean, I wasn't surprised by this. I know he hadn't been a coach coming in, but like anyone who followed his NFL career at all knows that, you know, Rex Ryan brought him along at every co- coaching stop he had because he would just, he knew the defenses so well and he'd be a, a coach on the field for you. So the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, uh, what's kind of going on at the State Journal, um, you know, talking about the, the ebb and flow of the newspaper business in Madison and where it's going. Uh, since the last time we talked, there was another round of cuts at the Wisconsin State Journal, the photo editor, longtime photo editor, uh, Steve, Steve Apps. I'm sure you you worked with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, an assistant editor, uh, the, bear, the beer baron uh, columnist, uh, Chris uh, Drosner, two veteran journalists, um, two big names uh, in Wisconsin media. Uh, they, they get shown the door. Um, I, obviously Chris is going to, he's going to still continue doing his column, but, uh, what, what did you make of that news? We were already like, kind of like sneering at some of the cuts two months ago and they just kind of keep trickling out. It seems like every six months or every year, there's just like a big, like another stunner. Uh, it just seems like keep happening. So I just, this last time around, what were your thoughts on the, the most recent cuts? Yeah, you know, and Steve's freelancing for them too. <laughs> a bit. So it's like outsourcing. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like outsourcing is what it boils down to. Making everybody a contractor. Yeah. Kind of thing. Right. I mean, I, you know, as I said previously, I mean, I feel bad for the people in that newsroom leading that newsroom. These aren't choices that they're making. These are mandates coming down about um, raw dollars and cents and what they want out of this product, what they want to milk out of the product. Uh, I mean, these are like the people who are leading that newsroom have been career journalists whose dream since they got in was to run, you know, like a hard hitting, fully staffed, robust uh, daily newspaper that does a great job um, exposing, being a watchdog, exposing injustice, this kind of thing, um, telling the story of Madison and it's like at every turn, like you said, they're they're just hampered by realities of the financial side of that business. Yeah, it's frustrating. I can't imagine the morale at that place. You know, right now, it's it it reminds you um, how lucky you are if you're in a business that is a growing business because it's this cascading effect of of opportunity or lack thereof. If you're on the other side of it. Um, growth industry. There's always new positions being created. There's always ways to move up the ladder to prove yourself. And it's the exact opposite when you're on the other side, you're just hanging on and trying to trying to see if you can ride it out and how long you want to ride it out. And I think the people who are, it, it's a real test on the resolve of the people who are there. Um, and I have no doubt that a lot of them are just firing on all cylinders still. This is what they want to do. They believe in journalism and, and they're fighting for it. And all these other circumstances be damned. You know, they're going to they're gonna go down fighting <laughs> to the very end. Um, so I give them a lot of respect, everyone who hangs in there. And uh, you know, on the flip side, like, I, it's been five, almost five years now since I left the, the uh, journalism business. And I, I, it still pains me to see all this, but I'm unfortunately a little bit removed emotionally at this point. It was pretty. It was pretty jarring and scarring, even a couple of years afterward. And it's tough to see. And on a personal level, that still hits. Um, but I think that everyone knows the situation now. This isn't coming as a shock. The economy's better. Frankly, like when this stuff went down in two thousand seven, two thousand eight, when you're seeing like really huge initial cuts, it wasn't like there was a lot of other options out there in the in the marketplace. Now it's a choice, and you got to look at it and say like, how how much do I believe in what I'm doing? And or is it time to look for opportunity elsewhere in the uh, in the private sector? <laughs> I was kind of joke like became a civilian when you leave the newspaper business because it's an entirely different way of looking at the world and looking at your job and your relationship with your job. Yeah, I, I know you've talked to some people who have left uh, the business and the industry. There's been a lot in Madison Media people that you've worked with. And and you've been through it. You've kind of like suffered the loss of identity, which we talked about in the last podcast. 
Uh, do you have any like counsel for when you talk to these people and just kind of like uh, be prepared for this or like think about it in this way? Is there anything that you kind of like talk about with uh, people who kind of are making that transition? You know, I can't say that anyone's been like beating down the door to get my opinion on it. <laughs> um, the The flip side of that is when I do it, when I have conversations with people who are still in it, it's like make sure you're make sure you're doing this because you want to do it. Don't feel obligated. Uh, this is your life, and you got to decide what you what you want to do out of it. Um, if there's other opportunities out there, great. If this is what you love doing and you want to stay in it, great. You know, I think the I think the big thing is is that most people, I would say, who get into journalism do it because that's what they want to do. It's not a job. It's it's like a passion. And there's a lot of people, I think, who if whether by choice or or by force aren't in it anymore and they have to figure out what they want to do when they grow up because they already did what they want to do. Yeah. And so where do you go on from there? And that's, that's a big thing. My advice, and I didn't do as good a job as this as I wanted was, I mean, I felt almost kind of, uh, like I was letting people down by leaving the business, I guess. And that, you know, you and I kind of clammed up and didn't talk a lot about it and anything. It's probably good to keep those lines of communication open try to like lean on friends and whatever else and find some other, find some other passion in your life, whether that's the one that you get paid for or off the clock, find something to fill that void. That's you know, the good thing for me has been the thing that I always really regretted was not being as involved in you know, my community or in volunteerism or finding like-minded people in, in clubs because the schedule is so erratic. I never could make or wanted to make commitments to anything else because the newspaper always came first. Um, so that's been something that I've kind of thrown myself into the last five years. That and my kids are eighth grade and fifth grade, two girls. And so this is a great time for me to be around for them. So that's taken a lot of the sting out of it. One of the things I want to talk about, which we didn't get to last time, was kind of how uh, the newspaper business or sports journalism was changing at the time you were still at the paper. Um, you were there. You were kind of like one of the first uh, wave of journalists to be using Twitter. Uh, at the time because it developed uh, social media just kind of like people forget it wasn't that long ago it was right. like 2005 to 2008 is kind of like the experimental phase for uh, using it in media and so I'm just kind of like curious like how how that how quickly Twitter became like something you had to do or, or like how did you view that and like what was the decision to like jump on it and start using it and in, in early on, the big fear was cannibalizing your product because even though we had, you know, had websites and we maybe didn't have the delivery channels and networks the same way that, you know, nowhere near what exists today. So it was like you scooping yourself by <laughs> what you put out on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, so that, that was kind of the initial entry point. Um, what, so are we asking, like, what do I think about what Twitter's done to the business? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think so. Uh, yeah, yeah, how did it change just the way that you approached your job? Yeah. Uh, the the advantages are clear, I think, and just be able to um, – even if you're in a place that maybe doesn't let you put your personal stamp on it, it's still, like, your chance to be the source. Uh, so there's a lot of – uh, opportunity there for people to establish themselves and establish their credibility, even outside of the outsider, along with the brand of the um, outlet that you're with. So I think that's great. Uh, it's a lot of pressure also because it's you doing it. A lot of the times you're able to sort of like bounce things off of editors or colleagues. Uh, you know, you're pursuing a big story that's kind of meaty that has some risk and exposure. And then you have to sit there and decide whether to you know, at 140 or 280 now, am I confident in what I'm putting in here? Um, you have to be your own editor. So I definitely see the value in it and getting word out and it's starting conversation and um, maybe giving a lot of like insight or color that wasn't appropriate for a newspaper article and not in a like an off color sense or in a uh, other sense. It just didn't fit a narrative or wasn't worthy of the level of coverage that you'd throw into a daily story um, or a larger story. So I really do feel like it gives you like a more well-rounded uh, look in some ways. 
Yeah, I don't like the clutter that social media produces. You really got to sift through a lot sometimes to find what you want, especially on a topic that everyone cares about. But the, the advantages are pretty clear. The disadvantage from a working standpoint to me was the same way that I'd feel when I would cover a game where you have a real danger of getting lost in the minutia and feeling uh, that where your attention is drawn away from really finding the, the, the main point of something that you're covering or someone that you're covering. And it interferes sometimes with your ability to, you know, step back and see the see the forest, to ask questions of yourself that might lead you to the deeper story, to a better story, um, because it's a lot of busy work in some cases. I still think you have to fight that as a journalist. And I feel like maybe that's happened, uh, you know, since I've gotten out that people don't feel compelled to, you know, provide constant updates. There's other vehicles that have come up. I mean, like, it's just to give a perspective on that, like when we came out, there were no like instant feeds necessarily of data at games. And so you felt like, hey, there's an opportunity to provide what just happened on first down, you know, in that Badger game for people who are somewhere else. Now the, that infrastructure is so built out that you can step back and sort of be the one who just adds in color and commentary if you're covering a game or, you know, give insights that aren't like um, minute by minute uh, and aren't just a commodity. You mentioned it is kind of like another thing that you have to do. Yeah. So, I mean, it, like journalists aren't getting paid more to like tweet. I mean, right. So, I mean, it's just like another another thing on top of what they were already doing. Do you see any conflicts from from that? Do you feel like Twitter is a necessity for a sports journalist now? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, and, and I'm missing the point somewhat on where it's problematic. It's not when you're – like it is when you're sitting in a game and you want to focus on the game, definitely. The problem is is that it's 24-7 and people have lives. <laughs> and <laughs> it's really – it changes the dynamic on your relationship with your job that if you just got done with, you know, a 14-hour day yesterday – because you're on assignment somewhere or or whatever popped up and you're not scheduled theoretically to be back on the clock until three in the afternoon when you go to practice or whatever it might be and something happens at eight in the morning, you know, you got to be able to respond pretty quickly to it. And that is probably easier for someone who is born into it. I imagine you go in, that's part of the deal. This is just how you think about things. Um, but for someone who is used to being able to kind of compartmentalize at least a little bit and have some plan and structure to your to your day, uh, that's a difficult transition. I mean, just thinking of like uh, like Ken Rosenthal, like he's talking yeah. about this, uh, the baseball writer yep. uh, who's always breaking stuff on Twitter, all like just constantly and like. How, how does that guy ever have time to spend with his family? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, yeah. and even to a lesser extent, um, you know, all of the, the beat writers for all of the sports, but maybe especially like baseball, uh, which is a, a kind of a, probably a grueling job to be a beat writer because uh, there's just so many games. Right. Uh, but then you also have to like break, break news whenever it happens. So if maybe you got Saturday off, but you got to news happens and you got to like break it on Twitter yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, that's difficult, right? Well, and, and probably compounded by the fact that staffs aren't as big. Mm -hmm. So there's not like this apprentice or, you know, junior reporter who can float around and cover for you, you know, from time to time, um, you know, whether you're on vacation or uh, travel day, you know, coming back from something. There's there's probably not that depth in the in the roster anymore to pull that off either. So you really are kind of, you need to make sure you're staying ahead of the curve rather than getting caught behind it, or at least have something to say. I mean, I guess that's the, that's the good bailout on that too, is this just came down the pike more to come. You know, but you have to, you have to weigh in. I feel like you have to weigh in. Otherwise people are going to be like, you know, where's so-and-so on this, yeah. on this thing. And people being both readers and editors <laughs> that are <laughs> going to call you and ask you why you haven't done anything on this. 
Well, that kind of brings up my my next topic, which is at the same time you have this social media thing going on or rising up uh, at, at at the time you were in at the paper. There was also this like growing thing of of blogs, of fan sites, uh, sites that are aggregators uh, using free writers. Writers that you know don't get paid, good but good business model. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm just kind of wondering how did you see yourself as, as a competitor to fan sites that weren't paying writers, and just how did that affect what you were doing as as a as a mainstream, if we're going to use that word, mainstream news uh, site or source? Yeah, I mean, like if it's if it's talking about you know some guy that started a website and is blogging. That's, I guess I don't view that as competition because it might be for content, but it's not advertising dollars. And at the end of the day, probably eyeballs. Um, you can actually milk some of that and see what people are interested in, use that as a barometer for should I pursue this angle? Is that a good question that he brought up? Should I you know, talk about that, he or she? But once you get into, like you said, you know, Bleacher Report, um, you know, SB Nation, these kind of sites that are fully backed, fully funded, uh, that have this network, a national advertising budget, and a network of people who are willing to do this on the side. Um, that's competition. That's definitely competition. And it's not even that they're delivering a product that is better necessarily. I mean, I won't denigrate. I mean, some of those people have are really good writers and bring up good points. And it's not, I'm not saying that, but um, it's more like a saturation thing of how do you make sure that you still break through and that you're still the one that people come to for information, for credible information. The thing that surprised me, I think the most in the emergence of all the new media is that people are willing to lend instant credibility to a lot of folks who are outside the bubble. And it's not, it, it's different if they're there every day and they're at practice and they're inside and they have insights and they have sources. It's the ones who kind of just throw out speculation all the time and uh, kind of further narratives that are out there without thinking about the implications of it. But people buy it, they buy into it. And I think that's the thing that surprised me the most out of what happened was that the brands of these major organizations aren't necessarily always strong enough to make people just kind of stick with it and be like, that's nice. I'll dilly dally in that, but I'm still going to go here every day for my, for my real information. So I think one of the things that you see young writers do now is they, they work for these sites to get the exposure. Yeah. Uh, you know, they can work from these sites and they can write about a professional sports team and kind of make that their thing and get noticed and then hopefully get a job at a, at a, an institution. That's not the way you came up. Uh, you know, it, it took time for you to probably be able to write for some of the... It takes somebody a long time to become a beat writer in the past to kind of work your way up if that's what you wanted to do to be able to cover professional sports mm -hmm. franchise. So I'm just kind of wondering if somebody were to ask you, like, should I do this? Should I not do that? You know, what? what's the past? Because it's worked out for some. Yep. I, I've seen it work out for some. Yep. To, to do the free thing and get exposure, but they're also not getting paid. So, I mean, what what is your, how do you kind of break that down and for a young writer of what to do and how to navigate today? That's a really good question. So at the end of the day, and you take all the bias out of it and how you feel about it philosophically, um, because I remember one day uh, I was with, I'll leave his name out of it. I was I was with a veteran journalist friend of mine at a coffee shop, and uh, some other guy overheard us talking or generally about journalism. And oh, you know, I'm a writer too. And oh, really? You know, what for? And he gave the you know the he's a blogger of some type. And my friend I was with uh, basically told him like, you realize that you are you know, undermining essentially undermining legitimate careers by what you're doing. And if your goal is to get into a legitimate career, you're cannibalizing your opportunity and kind of pointing out that perspective on it. Um, stepping back from that, hey, if that's what it is, if that's the path that's going to get you there, and if it's not good for everyone, 
you know what, that's that's your right. And this is a kind of a every person for themselves world. When you get into business world, it is. You figure out what the opportunity is that's going to work best for you. Um, in the old days, it might have been job jumping. You know, to your point about there's not uh, an instant path through. Be like, no, I'm not covering high school wrestling. I'm going to find a smaller Division One football or basketball program that I want to cover at a smaller paper, but that'll give me the exposure at that level that will then get me up there. So that's the path that you would take. So I won't fault anyone for doing that. The thing that I would caution against is you're half, a lot of your writing experience comes from just practical use of the craft, I feel like. Over time, you just get better at the way you use words, about how you structure stories. To think that that happens in a bubble is probably pretty naive. That you're just naturally going to progress to your maximum without input from editors, without the ability to talk to colleagues, to lean on colleagues and see how they operate. Um, you learn so much from being in an organization, this goes for any industry, that does things the right way, that you can learn some hard lessons at, hopefully by others' mistakes rather than your own, that you can learn some tricks because you're on the same team with someone and they'll show you the ropes and you know take a liking to you and that kind of thing. So I would caution against, unless you unless you just got it, I'd I'd be careful about throwing all your eggs in that basket for sure. Thinking about all these subjects that we've kind of talked about, social media, the proliferation of all these kind of uh, sites, um, blogging sites, you know, individuals, how, how did that kind of change the way reporting or just coverage uh, when you're interacting with uh, athletes and uh, or coaches, uh, how does that change the dynamic? Uh, yeah. Is it different? In a sense, the gatekeepers are gone in some in some ways, right? How does that change the practice of journalism and and you know how what fans see, what they don't see? Yeah, um, two levels to that. One is, I think it, as a newspaper writer, I always felt guarded in group situations about what I was going to talk about with people because. Um, I'd be as guilty as this as other. I mean, you hear a, a narrative brought up, you're like, geez, that's a, that's a good line to follow up with. I'm going to hop on that train and carry it through. And so if you're competing against someone who can go instantly to market with that information without having to, you know, run it through editors, without having to worry about deadlines, you know, without other assignments, I think you're always wary of giving away your idea and your maybe connection with this source because you're going to get something that that person's not. But if you have to ask it in a group setting, everyone's getting it, if that makes sense. In the old days, it was like TV because what you'd ask that day would show up on the five o'clock news, six o'clock news, 10 o'clock news before your newspaper would come out the following day. And even if it didn't, to my point about connections, like that's the whole point. You try to develop uh, professional relationships with, with people so that you can get information that others don't, period. And if people could just bandwagon on that, that's tough. The thing, and you're talking about the, the impact of uh, social media, of maybe the breakdown of that's something that's not going to get shared with the rest of the world, of having, because it's not newsworthy, essentially, it's it's maybe uh, celebrity behind the scenes pull back the curtain stuff, but it's not newsworthy. You you lose some of that good kind of back and forth, I think, because people are de definitely more guarded. I don't think that happens at most levels yet, but at the pro level, for sure. I mean, all these organizations so much more of like of a corporate feel and a really a lockdown on who and when you have access to and, you know, why you have access. So you do lose some of that sort of like glimpses into behind the scenes and how places operate. Here's, here's a, a case in point. There's one other story that I thought about that I won't share still today because it happened in a small NBA pregame room and 
it was an inside situation. It was a, it was, it played off a inside dynamic that everyone knew between a coach and their publicity person, the, the head uh, spokesperson for an NBA team. And it could have only happened because it was a safe place. And it could only happen because of their relationship that that would allow it to be happen. When that story would get taken out and someone did, it was kind of like, why? Why did you share that? That's not a, it's no one else's business what happened. It's not newsworthy. Uh, it didn't reveal a flaw in someone's character. It was a funny episode that was meant to be shared in that room and only in that room and wouldn't have happened if they knew you were going to report about it. So that would never happen today, probably. That's one that sticks with me. I'm not going to reveal the names because I feel like then I'd be doing the same thing. <laughs> Here's one that I will share. It was one of the greatest memories that I have of being in sports writing in the, covering the Brewers, which I do occasionally. I wasn't a beat guy, so I'd show up there and I'd always be a little bit more of a fly on the wall and let the beat guys carry the, carry the conversation, get what they needed. Um, but there'd be accessibility pregame with Phil Garner, with the Brewers manager, every game. You'd get, you know, 10, 15 minutes, something like that. Uh, generally a small group. Wouldn't be a TV camera there. And I don't say that in terms of like exposure. It was just a, a more casual setting because of that, because you didn't need a sound bite out of it. It was a chance to just kind of BS with him, ask questions about the team, you know, what middle relievers available today, that kind of thing, just so you had a, more information on the team. Well, I walked in there one day, and the, uh, the conversation is already going on. Garner is sitting back and listening. And it's Bob Eucher and his old St. Louis Cardinals teammate, Tim McCarver, who is in town because he was part of the road TV crew that day. And these guys are just sitting there holding court, telling stories about their life on the road in the 1960s and what baseball was like then. And they went on for 25 minutes. He was me. I think Tom Hardercourt from the Journal Sentinel was there. Maybe one or two other people. Uh, we were the Garner was the audience as much as we were, <laughs> and just taking in some of this history and some of this backstory and funny stories and anecdotes that you heard. I kn I'm sure that still goes on now. Um, and I was privileged enough to be in that setting where they felt comfortable, even in front of me, someone they didn't know very well, sharing that, uh, sharing those stories. Do they today? Am I not allowed in that room when they're telling that anymore? You know, could be, was it, was it relevant for anything other than, you know, a book I'd be writing about Bob Uecker? <laughs> no, but it was entertaining. And uh, that was, that was a thrill to be in the middle of, and it was really cool to be a part of. And, and I know that you might think, well, why, why isn't that worthy of sharing with readers? Um, it, it definitely interest in that. There's no doubt about it but it wasn't an interview setting. Uh, if you said to these guys, Hey, can, you know, I'm going to turn on the recorder, you know, talk, they're not going to talk about it. So that there was, it was more like, uh, that we were privy to some, um, some good stories and also some backstory that informed you in terms of the news that you would relate to people. So I, I would mourn that if that really doesn't happen today, the way I worry, it doesn't happen today. I would mourn that that's not a part of it anymore. Part of the whole experience because it does lead to more informed sports writers that are telling you stories. Maybe you can go back later on and dig with Bob Uecker or Tim McCarver about a particular incident that happened that you wouldn't have known about unless they shared it with you first in a, you know, kind of an off the record situation. I feel like the main way just people communicate, celebrities communicate these days is on their own terms. Yeah. Uh, they have a social media account and they can, just tweet instead of talk if they want to respond to something they did wrong or whatever and they want to have a filter filter themselves yep uh th they can just do that they don't need uh a reporter to tell that story anymore and you, you see sites like the players tribune right. uh telling a lot of stories that in the past um you know sports illustrated would be telling yep uh w what do you make of that athletes don't really need to speak to the media in the same way that they used to. I think back to, and I think anyone can take this on a personal level. Just look at, if you had a choice between having someone throw a microphone at you and ask tough questions and put you on the spot and not believe 
what you have to say and kind of keep asking you for detail about why is this, you know, this doesn't make sense. Why'd you do that? Or why'd you use that word? Um, that kind of thing. Um, and writing my own version of what happened. It's like, would you rather go to court and be put under oath and <laughs> uh, ask your version of events? Or would you rather just write them down and send in the paper and, and not get cross-examined? That's kind of what it boils down to to me. Uh, the fact that there's not more scrutiny maybe on, uh, you know, backstories or explanations. I think that we all kind of lose a little bit by that. Fortunately, I feel like at the same time, people don't have these conceptions about who athletes are or aren't anymore. Um, I think maybe there's some natural skepticism that's out there already that kind of takes care of that. I mean, I, I think there's to, to the point of why is the press still useful in something like that? If you really want the truth, someone's got to be under the microscope and that goes in sports, politics, whatever the case might be, rather than just hearing their version of the story, because everything's turned into spin these days. Even if it's just a slight twist of the actual truth, that twist is still there. Talking baseball, uh, I, I got to ask you, since uh, it's Hall of Fame voting season, uh, and you are a member of the Baseball Writers Association of America, which implies that you get to vote on the Hall of Fame. Uh, how how did that happen? How, you know, you weren't a beat writer. How, how do you get the how do you get the card? How do you, you know how does that that work? There's a uh, there's a guy uh, out in the Oakland area, uh, Ryan Thibodeau, who pulls together um, Hall of Fame ballots every year, and it's voluntary whether you release them or not. Uh, but he's really good at it, and he's very polite. And every year he asks whether I'll share it. And I say always. Um, on the day that everything's announced uh, because I still feel like that's one of those things that's kind of special. I think surprises in life are special. I think that the guy who's getting the call from the hall of fame saying you're in should have no idea that that call is coming. I think that's the thrill. I've heard too many stories about what happens to players when they get that call and the feeling it is. And, and I don't want to remove any of that, that specialness. I also don't want to influence anyone else's vote. Not that I would. I wouldn't want anyone else to influence anyone else's vote. Oh, mm -hmm. they're going to get in anyway. I'll cast for them. Or, oh, they're going to get anyway. I won't vote for them. Like, I, f I worry that it skews um, what is already kind of a tricky elections process. <laughs> uh, but my point on him compiling all this is he looked on the list of names and uh, you see some of these national baseball writers and names that are familiar with. You've seen on ESPN. You've seen on Fox or whatnot. And then you hit mine and I can only wonder like, <laughs> who is this joker who's on there? And frankly, like I don't broadcast that I have a vote because of that. I'm very fortunate to have a vote. Um, I was in, what happened was, is that I was an editor of the sports uh, uh, the section at the Capital Times and they expanded the membership or they, I shouldn't even say they expanded it. It became available to me because I was an editor. And so I decided to sign up because I've always been a big baseball fan. And Really, it meant just paying dues and having a card and uh, being affiliated with the organization, supporting the organization. And uh, I got in my 10 years in the organization, at which point you get an honorary status for life if for whatever reason that you're out, whether you retire, you know, leave the business, whatever it might be. And that was that tenure is enough to get you a Hall of Fame ballot. I think... I mean, people can debate whether it's fair, whether I have one or not, I guess. <laughs> I'm really glad that I do. I feel like that I know the players in those years well enough that I can have a great debate with anyone about it. Um, and I see some of the votes, the ballots that come in from people who I really respect uh, from their credentials as a baseball writer for years and years and years. And I think my ballot in many cases is superior to theirs. So... Um, I'm not going to apologize for it at all, <laughs> but uh, rightly I get 10 years and then I'm cut off because that'll be the period of time that I've been out and away from covering the game on a day-to-day -day basis and don't have the kind of the knowledge or expertise to be able to rank some of the, the players who would be eligible for consideration after that. Uh, but it's a real thrill. 
It's a really, every year that envelope comes in the mail and it still comes in an envelope and you still mail it back in an envelope. It's, it's awesome. Just kind of stare at that thing and think how lucky I am to be one of the 450 people here in the country who gets to weigh in on that. So I know you're not going to give me what your vote is this year. <laughs> not but, yet. But what, <laughs> we'll look at it later. Uh, but what are, what are some of the interesting um, players that, that you really have to like scrutinize this year that are kind of like uh, the ones that you're going to be thinking about the hardest uh, this year? The obvious elephant in the room is the steroids issue. Mm-hmm. It's still there, not going away. It's only going to get harder to deal with. Joe Morgan, the Hall of Fame um, second baseman for the Reds and longtime announcer, sent out a letter. And I've never seen – everyone's been waiting for years for guidance from the Hall of Fame on how to handle this issue. Never seen anything. That's the first thing I've ever seen. It's not from them. It's from Joe, but it got – dispersed through their channels about Joe Morgan representing old time hall of famers who feel that no one with uh, established PED connection should get in. It was a well-written letter. He wasn't fooling himself. He wasn't saying there aren't people who we don't know about who used, Yeah, but he just or people thinks, from his era that took uppers all the time. You could, I you mean, can talk about that. I mean, that's, that's something you can definitely fire back on. Um, but he, he gave a very, it was a very reasoned approach to it and not making it, uh, you know, a witch hunt on players who you don't have any proof of whatsoever that they used at the same time. I mean, it's a clear message for Bonds, Clemens, especially those are the two that stand out. If you want to include Sosa, you know, he's still, he's still there on the ballot. He's not getting the votes that are anywhere near consideration. Whereas those two have been kind of creeping up in vote totals. McGuire, who's not you know, eligible anymore at this point, maybe a veterans committee pickup. The hard cases are not Manny Ramirez, who got busted. That's out there. You can choose. You got uh, you know, David Ortiz, who's coming up in a couple of years, who's someone that basically is universally liked and had a great career. His name came out as one of the people in the confidential tests yeah. to determine the rates of steroid use in players. Uh, one of the few players, I think it was four out of 103 whose names were leaked. So, it, you know, how do you gauge that? Uh, Yvonne Rodriguez last year got brought up as someone, you know, like, yeah, that guy used. Um, Bagwell, someone who had suspicions a lot of his career. I heard enough back channel stuff to make me think that he did, but no one could prove it. I couldn't find anything definitive to prove it. I voted for those two guys. I haven't brought myself around to Clemens and Bonds. I voted for them the first year that I was on the Hall of Fame under the, the argument in my mind that these guys were Hall of Fame players before they used, according to all documentation of when they started using. Uh, and it, I couldn't, I could, it did not sit well with me. And I went back on it the next year and I haven't voted for them since. And I don't plan on voting for them again this year. I haven't ruled out changing my mind on that because we're in really murky ground. And I don't pretend to have some you know, high moral standing or anything along those lines of who's in already, who's not, who's done stuff in the past that shouldn't be in. But it's really, really difficult argument, I think, either way to stand on and not be able to poke holes in either side that you choose. I I think that brings up uh, something I kind of wanted to ask about, which is, you know, a guy whose career isn't over yet, but he's uh, well known in Wisconsin, which is Ryan Braun. Five years ago, you might have said this guy is on his way. He, now that he's had, uh, he's been suspended for because of steroids. It's out there. How does that impact his his potential Hall of Fame uh, process when he retires? Well, he's made it easy by not putting up <laughs> Hall of Fame numbers the last few years. I would say, um, and you wonder how much of that dragged him down or propped him up. You know, for for the first few years of his career. He, he seems to stand alone in terms of wearing the Scarlet S. <laughs> well, is that fair? I mean, I guess, you know. Yeah, it's his own doing. That's his own doing. You know, I always wondered going back, who's, who's given him advice from a public relations standpoint? <laughs> Let's say that the narrative is that he took steroids in 2011 because he knew that was – the Brewers' best shot, and um, he needed to stay on the field, and he was hurt. Let's say that's the narrative, like the Andy Pettit kind of. Um, I only did it because I was injured. 
all is forgiven, Andy. You're great. Uh, you know, that's an easy, easy sell to the fan base in Milwaukee, to the fan base around the country, uh, to say, you know what? I cared so much about bringing a title to Milwaukee that I made a decision um, that was not a good decision, that looks bad on me, it looks bad on the team, it looks like I don't care about the integrity of the game. All of that stuff is not true. I made a horrible mistake. I hope uh, you'll forgive me and we can move on from this. Instead of coming up with a story and a technicality that uh, you know won a court decision or a non-court court decision um, about how the handling of the sample was done and threw someone under the bus who was following protocol, whether that was good protocol or not, you know, that, that, and stands by the story and stands by the story and stands by the story until it blows up in his face. That's more of a character issue than a PED issue. I mean, look at, like I said, look at Manny. No one, no one holds that against Manny. It was Manny being Manny, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's, but it is a different perception. Even if you think less of him, it's not that you think less of him. It's like, oh, you, you know, he cheated and used roids. It's not, it's not, he's a dirt bag or <laughs> I don't trust his character or getting booed in other cities because he used PEDs. So Brun kind of made his own bed. I would give him credit for trotting himself out there every day. The last, you know, whatever that is, four, four years now is kind of a pariah in his own town in visiting towns, nice. he takes some cheap shots. I think I think that like they go back to that Kirk Gibson where he drills him in a game in Arizona just to make a point. You know that's just that that's exposing you for being even less than what you're saying he is. Uh, so I, I think that some of the treatment has been unfair, but he did make his own bed in terms of his reputation. What do you tell your kid, man? He's got kids. What are, you, what are they going to get when they're going to school and a Porsche? <laughs> right right does it make up for everything i don't know no i mean I've, i wonder i seriously do wonder sometimes about like how how has he handled that you know internally with people that he's close to that with the people he's close to still obviously not number 12 um anymore uh you know does does he have good friends uh does he have a wide circle of friends has he been able to rebuild that a little bit. I don't think he does in baseball. Every poll you see, he's like the most hated player in every clubhouse. Um, you know, that's that's a tough burden to carry for a, for a long time. And I don't know how you get out from under it. Just likability is going to hurt his, his Hall of Fame chances. I mean, because he's got uh, probably five productive, we'll see, productive se- potential productive seasons ahead of him at least. Uh, which will get him probably to some of the the kind of red lines for making into the hall in the past, which is like 3,000 hits, maybe 500 home runs, uh, RBI totals, also stolen base. Don't forget about the stolen base numbers right. that he gets about 20 a year. Right. Um, so he's going to be up there on some of these kind of red lines that have in the past been you're in the hall. Yeah. I know that hasn't worked out for Bonds and Clemens. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I mean, where do, I mean, I guess, where do you see that shaking out? I mean, is there some detente at some point? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you never, I learned you never say never, that's for sure. <laughs> but um, it would have to, there would have to be definitely, like you say, first probably be some kind of reckoning on these other mm-hmm. uh, players because I don't think the conversation can even get to Ryan Braun until that part of it gets resolved. In some ways, it takes care of itself because if they don't get elected, before their tenure is on the ballot, then they're not up for consideration anymore. And it just kind of hangs out there and exposes them further. If they do get in, then maybe you start having those conversations about it. But it's it put it this way. It's like two steps of hypothetical at this point that that gets resolved and that he puts up numbers that validate getting into the Hall of Fame. I'm kind of skeptical on either. Uh, so... Uh, over under on the Brewers winning the World Series next year, just Ooh. as a, as a way to close out the uh, the podcast. Man, you know, with with no postseason pickups yet at this point. Well, I hope make it easier for you. Playoffs, yeah. playoffs or not? Playoffs or not? Because anything can happen if you get in the playoffs. So, right. So what? That's uh, true. What are the odds on the playoffs? That's true. Are you feeling good about their chances or uh, more negative? 
No, I mean, I, they really amazed me the way they play this year. I thought that was a fantastic story. They were fun to watch, listen to, whatever your preference. I like how they played. I like a lot of these young players, like Council, like the way the organization's going. So, I mean, I think everything um, points upward. But you also benefited from mediocre year for the Cardinals, uh, not a great year for the Cubs. And so the circumstances are right. Pittsburgh was down from what it had been. I mean, I, I give a decent chance, and I would say it's 25 to 1, something on those lines. I still wouldn't go put money on it in any real fashion <laughs> with them getting into the playoffs. That changes if they pick someone up. I think losing Jimmy Nelson hurts a lot because I felt like they were already one starter short, and it's another two starters short. And I remember back in the day for the Brewers, it was like, oh, man, you know, if only they had that number one starter and that cleanup hitter. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's kind of obvious, right? Those are the things that no one, right. that everyone wants. If they only had Mike Trout. Yeah, and... right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I feel like they have, they've got a, a really great framework and that they're on the right trajectory. But um, I'd want to see some more, some more pickups before I said next year. I feel like they have one more rung. I mean, obviously, they're one game away this year, so it's right there. It's in play if things break the right way. I guess I feel like things broke the right way in a lot of ways this year for them. Thank you to Adam for taking the time to chat with me again. Always fun to talk sports with him. Don't forget to subscribe to the Wisconsin Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. You can also stand a little bit about the pod by visiting wispod.com and following the show on Twitter at wispodcast and on Facebook at the Wisconsin Podcast. Cheers. Cheers.